Glencora Palliser and Plantagenet Palliser in Can You Forgive Her by Anthony Trollope. It's quite telling with regard to the nature of Glencora's experience that she says to Alice that marriage is something uh, to which she will probably eventually have to give way. Um, the conversation occurs in the chapter Dandy and Flirt, which is chapter 22. Uh, they're discussing Alice's age, and Alice is still unmarried at over five and twenty. Um, five and twenty seems so old to me, Glencora says. It would be nothing if you were married, only, you see, you won't get married. So this is after Alice has jilted John Gray. Perhaps I may someday, Alice says. Of course you will. You'll have to give way. You'll find that they'll get the better of you. Your father will storm at you, and Lady MacLeod will preach at you, and Lady Midlothian will jump upon you. So this, of course, um, was Glencora's experience of getting married. She had been in love quite deeply in love on her side with Burger Fitzgerald and she is coerced by her people, uh, family members, kinswomen, kinsmen, to marry Plantagenet Palliser. As the pivotal role in a woman's life in, in this period for m most women in this social group, um, it's quite a harsh fate to be pressed into an indissoluble marriage uh, in which there's no emotional investment on your part and especially if you feel there's no emotional investment on your husband's part which is definitely how Glencora feels. No child has come along yet, um, Glencora is still very young and there's plenty of time for that but it's playing on her mind that no child has come as yet. The marriage between Glencora and, and Palliser um, is a rather staid affair um, and rather uncomfortable affair, really. Um, much of this lies in the difference of their personalities, um, not just in the fact that it's more or less an arranged or uh, pretty much an arranged marriage, an endogmatic marriage. Um, Glencora is irrepressible, she is very humorous, she is rather witty and enjoys wordplay, she's extremely feminine and rather romantic. She likes looking at ruins in the moonlight. She uh, has a, a beautiful personal sitting room which she refers to as her dressing room. Um, she regards it as very pretty. She more than once says how pretty it is. She hasn't herself alone furnished and decorated it. Um, it was apparently mainly designed by the Duke of Omnium. But she revels in its prettiness and its femininity. And she's very much at home as a character in this setting. Glencora is in some ways really quite fashionable as well. She's part of the young set. She likes uh, flashy modern language uh, in a way that Plantagenet Palliser does definitely not. Um, Plantagenet is a very different character. He's quite staid, he's quite reticent. He's under 30, but he gives the impression of being a much older man by his seriousness and indeed his humorlessness. He's def definitely not demonstrative. So these two very different personalities have been thrown together in an arranged marriage. Um, Trollope has his views of, of both characters. Um, he says of Plantagenet Palliser, take him all together. I think Plantagenet Palliser stands more firmly on the ground than any other personage 
I have created. And he regarded Glencora as being proportionately um, less in her character, less great. Um, his wife in all respects inferior to him, but she too has or has been intended to have beneath the thin stratum of her follies a basis of good principle which enabled her to live down the conviction of the original wrong which was done her and taught her to endeavour to do her duty in the position to which she was called. Um, I think the modern reader might be a little bit more inclined to um, consider that seriousness doesn't necessarily ally with greatness um, and that a sense of fun and a sense of frivolity doesn't necessarily preclude greatness. The pathways open to Glencora in her life will not be the same as the opportunities open to Plantagenet Palliser, so she won't have the opportunity to prove herself um, as great in public life in the way that he has. Her, her role is more limited. Um, nonetheless, I think that uh, people find her a very compelling character and there must therefore be some element um, within the human interest of her character which is fairly universal um, and uh, of enduring interest at, at the very least. Um, the, the marriage between um, Plantagenet and Glencora is depicted um, in many respects in quite traditional terms. Um, issues to do with obedience which have been uh, discussed um, earlier especially in the section the video on Alice um, and the nature of the um, power and the distribution of power within marriage between a man and a woman um, comes out quite um, noticeably um, as the story of the Palliser marriage unfolds. Um, she, Glencora refers to Plantagenet as playing Lord and Master at one point. Their marriage is beset by Glencora's lingering feelings for Berger Fitzgerald. In discussing um, her fears about encountering Burgo at Monkshade uh, with Alice, um, um, Alice tells her, You must not go, no power should take you there. That is easily said, child, but all the same, I must go. I told Mr. Palliser that he would be there and he said it did not signify. He actually said that it did not signify. I wonder whether he understands what it is for people to love each other, whether he has ever thought about it. You must tell him plainly that you will not go. I did. I told him plainly, as words could tell him. Glencora, he said, you know the way he looks when he means to be lord and master, and put on the very husband indeed. This is an annoyance which you must bear and overcome. It suits me that we should go to Monkshade, and it does not suit me that there should be any one whom you are afraid to meet. Could I tell him that he would lose his wife if I did go? Could I threaten him that I would throw myself into Burgo's arms if that opportunity were given to me? You are very wise and very prudent. What would you have had me say? So we see here that... Um, this is a very haughty attitude on the part of Plantagenet, that it suits him to go to Monkshade and it suits him for his wife to go with him, and therefore there's no real debate about whether or not she's going. 
<laughs> in the end, Glencora pulls a bit of a, a, sick, <laughs> um, a fake sickness in order to um, not go to Monkshade. Um, but, yes, yeah, she refers to him as Lord and Master, and, as it seems, if her husband puts her under compunction to travel with him, she pretty much thinks that she must go. She doesn't dispute altogether his right um, to her obedience. And this comes up later as well in discussions about going to Lady Monk's party. Um, so it, it comes up, uh, on the morning of Lady Monk's party, a few very uncomfortable words passed between Mr. Palliser and his wife. Your cousin is not going then, said he, Alice is not going. Then you can give Mrs. Marsham a seat in your carriage. Impossible, Plantagenet. I thought I had told you that I had promised my cousin Jane. But you can take three. Indeed I can't, unless you would like me to sit out with the coachman. There was something in this, a tone of loudness, a touch of what he called to himself vulgarity, which made him very angry. So he turned away from her and looked as black as a thundercloud. You must know, Plantagenet, she went on, that it is impossible for three women dressed to go out in one carriage. I am sure you wouldn't like to see me afterwards if I had been, in, been one of them. You need not have said anything to Lady Jane when Miss Vavasor refused. I had asked you before that. And I had told you that I liked going with young women and not with old ones. That's the long and the short of it. Glencora, I wish you would not use such expressions. What, not the long and the short? It's good English. Quite as good as Mr. Botts when he is in the house the other night that the government kept their accounts in a higgledy-piggledy way. You see, I have been studying the debates and you shouldn't be angry with me. I am not angry with you. You speak like a child to say so. Then I suppose the carriage must go for Mrs. Mrs. Marsham after it has taken you. It shall go before... Jane will not be in a hurry, and I am sure I shall not. She will think you very uncivil, that is all. I told her that she could go with you when I heard that Miss Vavasor was not to be there. Then, Plantagenet, you shouldn't have told her so, and that's the long, but I mustn't say that. The truth is this, if you give me any orders, I'll obey them as far as I can. If I can't, I'll say so. But, I'm left, but if I'm left to go my own judgment, it's not fair that I should be scolded afterwards. I have never scolded you. Yes, you have. You have told me that I was uncivil. Um, and so it goes on. So in this short conversation, um, we hear Plantagenet say to Glencora that she speaks like a child to say so. And yet he is treating her a little bit like a child. He's not allowing her to make her own arrangements for her evening out. Um, as a point of fact, they own these carriages and horses with ease because of the fortune that Glencora has brought into the marriage. Um, she um, says to him as well, um, you know, the truth is that if you give me any orders, I'll obey them. And this nuance um, is noticeable in, in other conversations in the novel, apart from just this one, where um, Glencora uh, will go her own way unless she's given specific directions from her husband that she should do certain things. And this sense of that once a husband has laid down the the line, the family line, or laid down the law within the family about what is to happen, that has to be obeyed. And she, she doesn't seem to question that at all. She accepts that that's the situation. If he takes up the authority, she automatically submits. And then, again, this um, idea that she's being scolded, this again will occur again in the novel, um, the idea that a wife is scolded by husband, told off um, as someone younger, someone more junior, someone less important, someone more menial. It's just an interesting, it's an interesting observation. Um, these aspects of the marriage um, 
are, you know, probably something that Alice observes in marriages which she wishes to, to avoid. Um, the whole um, episode with Burgo Fitzgerald and Glencora's struggle about whether or not she will run away with him and commit adultery is probably quite hard for the modern reader to take as seriously as the contemporary reader would have done. Um, the absolute disgrace that would have fallen on Glencora um, through doing this, um, even she herself uh, begins to abhor herself, her, her mind, her principles for even considering such a, a move with Burgo Fitzgerald. Um, in his autobiography, um, Trollope discusses some, something of the moral dilemma that was involved in this. Uh, he says that Glencora, she had received a great wrong, having been made when little more than a child to marry a man for whom she cared nothing. When, however, though she was little more than a child, her love had been given elsewhere. She had very heavy troubles, but they did not overcome her. As to the heaviest of these troubles, I will say a word in vindication of myself and the way I handled it in my work. In the pages of Can You Forgive Her, the girl's first love is introduced, beautiful, well-born and utterly worthless. To save a girl from wasting herself and an heiress from wasting her property on such a scamp was certainly the duty of the girl's friends. But it must ever be wrong to force a girl into a marriage with a man she does not love, and certainly the more so when there is another whom she does love. In my endeavour to teach this lesson, I subjected the young wife to the terrible danger of overtures from the man to whom her heart had been given. I was walking, no doubt, on ticklish ground, leaving for a while a doubt on, on the question whether the lover might or might not succeed. Um, then there came to me a letter from a distinguished dign dignitary of our church, um, and he uh, <laughs> relates the story of how he was himself scolded um, for um, raising such an unseemly and improper topic within his novels, um, and this church dignitary had actually forbidden his daughters from reading Can You Forgive Her? Glencora's transgression of considering adultery really for the period was far, far worse than Alice's transgression of having jilted two men. Um, and there may be a question in the reader's mind uh, at points, which woman they're really supposed to be forgiving. Because Glencora is um, very free-spirited, um, despite her great wealth, not particularly materialistic, um, I think she is able able to overcome the moral moral question marks that would have hung over her uh, in the period. Uh, overcome as a character the moral moral question marks. Um, one of her seemingly foibles in the eyes of um, the cronies who hang around Plantagenet Palliser, uh, Mrs. Marsh, uh, Mr. Bott. Um, is that she is very young. Um, now, Plantagenet himself is, as I just said, still under 30, so he's not too old. Um, um, Yes, one of the Miss Pallisers who are Plantagenet Pallisers' cousins says, um, says after, after Alice is blamed for having kept Glencora out in the cold too much looking at the ruins in the moonlight, um, seemingly Alice should have taken responsibility for bringing 
Glencora in, Alice um, does not concur with this viewpoint at all. Um, Miss Palliser says, I don't think um, he, Plantagenet Palliser, has been unreasonable. I don't indeed, Miss Vavasor. He has certainly been vexed. Sometimes he has much to vex him. You see, Glencora is very young, so Plantagenet has much to vex him with regard to his wife. Um, and it's he who has not been unreasonable in blaming Alice for having kept Glencora out in the moonlight, even though the whole escapade was Glencora's idea in the first instance. And she is, of course, mistress of the house where the ruins are located. Um, the narrator goes on, Mr. Bott had also declared that Lady Glencora was very young. It was probable, therefore, that that, that special phrase had been used in some discussion among Mr. Palliser's party as to Glencora's foibles. So thought Alice, as the remembrance of the word came upon her. She is not younger than when Mr. Pallis Palliser married her, Alice said. You mean that if a man marries a young wife, he must put up with the trouble? That is a matter of course, but their ages, in truth, are very suitable. My co cousin himself is not yet thirty. When I say that Glencora is young, you mean that she is younger in spirit? and perhaps in conduct, than he had expected to find her. So, um, yes, Glencora is very innocent, I think, really, uh, for her age and also um, for being a married woman and being the mistress of a large estate, uh, matching priory, um, and for having grown up herself uh, in great wealth, circumstances of great wealth. She's an elusive um, and um, rather intriguing uh, character. In, so there are quite a lot of little spats and arguments between Glencora and Palliser, um, in which for the most part she gets the better of him because she's just simply, as Trollope puts it, more ready than Plantagenet is. She's good at wordplay, um, and she's also good at making a little bit of fun of someone who takes themselves very, very seriously. Glencora enjoys fashionable language. We saw a little bit of that uh, in the last uh, passage that I read, the long and the short of it, which she's not supposed to say, apparently. <laughs> um, she is a little bit defiant. So, I mean, again, we come back to the value system that patined around a wife's conduct in the 19th century. Um, Plantagenet is angry with um, Glencora at times when he perceives her to be defying him. Um, as, for example, when she says that she will not receive Mr. Bott or Mrs. Marsh in her home again as guests. Uh, this really deeply angers Plantagenet because um, they are friends of his, people whom he wishes to include. And he does see this as defiance on Glencora's part. He doesn't see it as an assertion of her will or an assertion of her right to um, have some say in what goes on in the home. It's just defiance. Um, Glencora does not quite fulfil the uh, requirements of a man like Plantagenet Palliser would have had uh, for his wife. He wishes to be taken very seriously at quite a young age as a member of the establishment. He's highly ambitious to succeed within public life. And he needs behind him a woman who is um, of very stable temperament, who is capable of, at all times, conforming to appropriate etiquette. This is just simply not Glencora's way. Um, <laughs> Mrs Marsham talks in terms of 
um, stuffing her down, I think, at some point. Um, yes, Mrs. Marsham, Mrs. Marsham had never believed that Mr. Palliser's wife would really be false to her vows. It was not in fear of any such catastrophe as a positive elopement that she had taken upon herself the duty of duenna. Lady Glencora would, no doubt, require to be pressed down into that decent mould which it would become the wife of a Mr Palliser to assume as her form. And this pressing down and this moulding, Mrs Marsham thought that she could accomplish. Um, so, <laughs> yes, Glencora needs to be pressed down and moulded. And she's perhaps at no point more... Um, acutely described in her shortcomings um, in terms of being the most appropriate wife for a man such as Plantagenet Palliser when she's compared with the Marchioness of Hartletop who is absolutely perfect in terms of uh, social etiquette on all <clears throat> Glencora does not quite fulfil the uh, requirements of a man like Plantagenet Palliser would have had uh, for his wife. He wishes to be taken very seriously at quite a young age as a member of the establishment. He's highly ambitious to succeed within public life and he needs behind him a woman who is um, of very stable temperament, who is capable of at all times conforming to appropriate etiquette. This is just simply not Glencora's way. Um, <laughs> Mrs Marsham talks in terms of um, stuffing her down, I think at some point. Um, Yes, Mrs. Marsham, Mrs. Marsham had never believed that Mr. Palliser's wife would really be false to her vows. It was not in fear of any such catastrophe as a positive elopement that she had taken upon herself the duty of duenna. Lady Glencora would, no doubt, require to be pressed down into that decent mould which it would become the wife of a Mr. Palliser to assume as her form. And this pressing down and this moulding Mrs. Marsham thought that she could accomplish. Um, so, <laughs> yes, Glencora needs to be pressed down and moulded. And she's perhaps at no point more um, acutely described in her shortcomings um, in terms of being the most appropriate wife for a man such as Plantagenet Palliser when she's compared with the Marchioness of Hartletop who is absolutely perfect in terms of uh, social etiquette on all occasions, in all circumstances. Um, so she, Lady Hartletop, never said silly things like the Duchess, the Duchess of Bungay, never was troublesome as to people's conduct to her, was always gracious, yet was never led away into intimacies was without peer the best-dressed woman in London, and yet gave herself no airs. And then she was so exquisitely beautiful. Her smile was loveliness itself. There were, indeed, people who said that it meant nothing, but then what should the smile of a young married woman mean? She had not been born in the purple like Lady Glencora, her father being a country clergyman who had never reached a higher rank than that of an archdeacon. But she knew the ways of high life and was an exigent and what an exigent husband would demand of her, much better than poor Glencora. She would have spoken of no man as a baboon with a bristly beard, as Glencora had spoken of Mr Bond. She never talked of the long and the short of it. She did not wander out o' nights in the winter among the ruins. She made no fast friendship with ladies whom her lord did not like, that's to say, Alice Vavasor. She had not once, indeed, 
She had once indeed been approached by a lover since she had been married, Mr Palliser himself having been the offender. But she had turned the affair to infinite credit and profit, and had gained her husband's closest confidence by telling him of it all, had yet not brought on any hostile collision, and had even dismissed her lover without annoying him. But then Lady Hartletop was a miracle of a woman. Lady Glencora was no miracle. Though born in the purple, she was made of ordinary flesh and blood, and as she entered Lady Monk's little room, hardly knew how to recover herself sufficiently for the purpose of ordinary conversation, having just seen Burgo Fitzgerald downstairs. However, when it comes to her personality, uh, Lady Hartletop, the Marchioness of Hartletop, is shown to be um, quite cold, quite calculating, quite superficial. Um, like others, she observes and watches um, Glencora dancing with Burgo Fitzgerald um, at the party. Lady Hartletop saw it and just raised her eyebrows. It was nothing to her. She liked to know what was going on, as such knowledge was sometimes useful, but as for heart, what she had was, in such a matter, neither good nor bad. Her blood circulated with its ordinary precision, and in that respect, no woman ever had a better heart. So yes, Lady Hartletop, whilst being perfect, is also very cold, um, which Glencora most certainly isn't. She is really very passionate um, to, to, you know, together with her um, high spirits and her humorousness, she is very passionate and very affectionate, very loving. She's looking for love, and it quite hurts her that she feels that Plantagenet Palliser doesn't love her. He doesn't seem to realise or understand that a woman needs to be loved. He just simply thinks that um, if his wife gives him no trouble and if he essentially provides a good home for her, that that's all that's really required. Um, yes, Plantagenet Palliser um, is shocked that Glencora thinks that she doesn't make him happy in the conversation that they have after he uh, extricates her from a potential elopement situation, although Glencora herself has already pulled back from making the decision to uh, flit with Burgo Fitzgerald. She says to him in this conversation uh, the next morning, she says to Plantagenet Palalong and the short of it, she did not wander out of nights in winter among the ruins. She made no fast friendship with ladies whom her lord did not like. She had not once indeed been approached by a lover since she had been married. Mr Palliser himself having been the offender. Oh, she had she had once indeed been approached by a lover since she had been married. So Lady Hartletop is quite acutely described as the, being the absolute reverse of Glencora and the most desirable type of a wife for someone in Plantagenet Palliser's position. She, Lady Hartletop, never said silly things like the Duchess, the Duchess of Bungay, never was troublesome as to people's conduct to her, was always gracious, yet was never led away into intimacies was without peer the best-dressed woman in London, and yet gave herself no airs. And then she was so exquisitely beautiful. Her smile was loveliness itself. There were, indeed, people who said that it meant nothing, but then what should the smile of a young married woman mean? She had not been born in the purple like Lady Glencora. 
her father being a country clergyman who had never reached a higher rank than that of an archdeacon. But she knew the ways of high life and was an exigent and what an exigent husband would demand of her, much better than poor Glencora. She would have spoken of no man as a baboon with a bristly beard, as Glencora had spoken of Mr. Bond. She never talked of the long and the short of it. She did not wander out o' nights in the winter among the ruins. She made no fast friendship with ladies whom her lord did not like, that's to say, Alice Vavasor. She had not once, indeed, she had once, indeed, been approached by a lover since she had been married, Mr. Palliser himself having been the offender. But she had turned the affair to infinite credit and profit, and had gained her husband's closest confidence by telling him of it all, had yet not brought on any hostile collision, and had even dismissed her lover without annoying him. But then Lady Hartletop was a miracle of a woman. Lady Glencora was no miracle. Though born in the purple, she was made of ordinary flesh and blood, and as she entered Lady Monk's little room, hardly knew how to recover herself sufficiently for the purpose of ordinary conversation, having just seen Burgo Fitzgerald downstairs. However, when it comes to her personality, uh, Lady Hartletop, the Marchioness of Hartletop, is shown to be um, quite cold, quite calculating, quite superficial. Um, like others, she observes and watches um, Glencora dancing with Burgo Fitzgerald um, at the party. Lady Hartletop saw it and just raised her eyebrows. It was nothing to her. She liked to know what was going on, as such knowledge was sometimes useful, but, as for heart, what she had was, in such a matter, neither good nor bad. Her blood circulated with its ordinary pre precision, and in that respect, no woman ever had a better heart. So, yes, Lady Hartletop, whilst being perfect, is also very cold, um, which Glencora most certainly isn't. She is really very passionate um, to, to, you know, together with her... Um, high spirits and her humorousness. She is very passionate and very affectionate, very loving. She's looking for love and it quite hurts her that she feels that Plantagenet Palliser doesn't love her. He doesn't seem to realise or understand that a woman needs to be loved. He just simply thinks that um, if his wife gives him no trouble and if he essentially provides a good home for her, that that's all that's really required. Um, Yes, Plantagenet Palliser um, is shocked that Glencora thinks that she doesn't make him happy in the conversation that they have after he uh, extricates her from a potential elopement situation, although Glencora herself has already pulled back from making the decision to uh, flit with Burgo Fitzgerald. She says to him in this conversation, uh, the next morning, she says to Plantagenet Palliser the next morning, I know that I have never made you happy, she said. I know that I never can make you happy. He looked at her, struck by her altered tone, and saw that her whole manner and demeanour were changed. I do not understand what you mean, he said. I have never complained. You have not made me unhappy. I know that I have never made you happy, she said. I know that I never can make you happy. 
He looked at her, struck by her, struck by her altered tone, and saw that her whole manner and demeanour were changed. I do not understand what you mean, he said. I have never complained. You have not made me unhappy. He was one of those men to whom this was enough. If his wife caused him no uneasiness, what more was he to expect from her? No doubt she might have done much more for him. She might have given him an heir. But he was just a man and knew that the blank he had drawn was his misfortune and not her fault. But now her heart was loosed and she spoke out, at first slowly, but after a while with all the quickness of strong passion. No, Plantagenet, I shall never make you happy. You have never loved me, nor I you. We have never loved each other for a single moment. I have been wrong to talk to you about spies. I was wrong to go to Lady Monk's. I have been wrong in everything that I have done, but never so wrong as when I let them persuade me to be your wife. Glencora, let me speak now, Plantagenet. It is better that I should tell you everything, and I will. I will tell you everything, everything. I do love Burgo Fitzgerald. I do, I do, I do. How can I help loving him? Have I not loved him from the first, before I had seen you? Did you not know that it was so? I do love Burgo Fitzgerald, and when I went to Lady Monk's last night, I had almost made up my mind that I must tell him so, and that I must go away with him and hide myself. But when he came to speak to me, he has asked you to go with him then, said the husband, in whose bosom the poison was beginning to take effect, thereby showing that he was neither above nor below humanity. Um, and the conversation continues in this very passionate vein, and this extremely honest vein. And it's the honesty of this exchange in which both of them discuss very lucidly uh, their feelings about the marriage, their feelings within the marriage, their feelings about one another, and their feelings about themselves within the marriage that actually opens up the way for the relationship to change and to ultimately blossom. The conversations between um, Glencora and Plantagenet are nearly always very lively, um, humorous, sometimes quite emotional, uh, very acute and very articulately expressed on both sides. The personalities of both characters come over distinctly by the very different style of language that they use. Um, Trollope himself highly valued dialogue in um, any writing. Um, he says, again in his autobiography, the dialogue is generally the most agreeable part of a novel but it is only so as long as it tends in some way to the telling of the main story. It need not seem to be confined to that, but it should always have a tendency in that direction. The unconscious critical acumen of the reader is both just and severe. When a long dialogue on extraneous matter reaches his mind, he at once feels that he is being cheated into taking something which he did not bargain to accept when he took up the novel. He does not at that moment require politics or philosophy. He wants his story. And certainly, in all of the conversations between Glencora and Plantagenet, the reader uh, receives the story. Alice is also quite mixed up, certainly in terms of the ethical depiction of marriage in Glencora's and Plant Plantagenet's relationship. Alice has been Glencora's confidant from the very start. She uh, was there um, and was sympathetic and listened to Glencora at the period when she was um, madly in love with Burgo but being um, pressurised by her family to marry um, Plantagenet. Alice refused to act as intermediary between them, refused to allow them to have assignations at her house in London, feeling that it was inappropriate for her as an unmarried woman to 
a host anything of the sort and it would probably have had um, an adverse uh, effect on her own uh, reputation which was important for her to preserve of course. Glencora always remembered Alice's sympathy at this period uh, in her life though and that is what um, bonds them uh, as friends, what bonds Glencora more strongly to Alice than Alice did Glencora. But of course that's typical of Alice's story, that she's not so good at bonding as other characters. Um, Alice, although she herself is contravening um, social customs with regard to breaking engagements and has behaved fairly badly towards John Gray who um, you know is deeply in love with her has believed that she's going to become his wife has you know prepared his home to receive her nonetheless Alice's um, attitudes towards Glencora who has taken the vows of mar marriage is really quite stringent she is very definite towards Glencora that it would not only be uh, destructive for Glencora's life and ruinous for Glencora's life and for her, of her happiness if she were to run away with Burgo Fitzgerald. But she clearly uh, indicates that, she, that it's a sin and that Glencora should not do this because it's also wrong. Um, she very strongly advises Glencora against going to Monkshade uh, for the, this reason. Um, and she doesn't really think that Glencora should, should talk much or think much about Burgo Fitzgerald. Um, after the failed elopement, um, uh, when Alice is with Glencora in Europe, Alice is quite um, severe towards Glencora about the fact that Glencora has caused her husband to come away from London, to come away from the political scene at that particular time when Parliament is in session, um, as a result of her behaviour with Burgo Fitzgerald. Um, Alice thinks that this is an imposition, an inconvenience, um, an impediment, a hampering of Plantagenet that his wife should by no manner of means have caused. Glencora, of course, sees it differently. Her relationship with um, Palliser is undergoing uh, a metamorphosis at this period. Um, and, of course, ultimately, the strength of their marriage is what will uh, support and help Palliser to succeed. Um, but that's, you know, further down the line in the Palliser stories. Um, by contrast, Alice stands up for uh, Glencora um, when she's being criticised. She... Um, very specifically says to one of the Miss Palliser's um, in defending Glencora that um, She um, defends Glencora's um, position um, it's in the same um, so in the same conversation in which Alice defends Glencora for being young, um, she also defends Glencora for um, continuing to have some memories of Burger Fitzgerald. Uh, she does take a much more um, supportive stance towards Glencora's emotions um, when it's other parties, palaces, um, hangers-on who are criticising Glencora's conduct. Um, I 
Alice says to Miss Palliser she had been attached to Mr Fitzgerald when your cousin married her. He knew that this had been the case. She told him the whole truth. In a worldly point of view, her marriage with Mr Fitzgerald would probably have been very imprudent. It would have been utterly ruinous. Perhaps so. I say nothing about that. But as it turned out, she gave up her own wishes and married your cousin. I don't know about her own wishes, Miss Vavasor. It is what she did. She would have married Mr Fitzgerald had she not been hindered by the advice of those around her. It cannot be supposed that she has forgotten him in so short a time. There can be no guilt in her remembrance. There is guilt in her loving any other than her husband. Then, Miss Palliser, it was her marriage that was guilty and not her love. But all that is done and past. It should be your cousin's object to teach her to forget Mr Fitzgerald, and he will not do that by taking her to a house where that gentleman is staying. So Alice um, blames the marriage, uh, the fact that Glencora has married against her heart, for the fact that she still loves another man apart from her husband, and also blames Palliser for not teaching her to love him as her husband, um, that he hasn't put enough effort into winning over Glencora. And it, it's, it's interesting, it's interesting how Alice's psychology operates. The conversations between Glencora and Palliser really bring out their two differing psychologies. Their characters uh, are really skillfully um, and quite delightfully actually manifested by Trollope through their conversations. And there's a lot of dramatic tension in the conversations as um, as well as honesty in that particular breakfast conversation, but there is quite a lot of dramatic tension in almost all of their conversations, until much later in the novel, when uh, their marriage really reaches a much calmer phase. They've settled into one another. Psychology of the two characters is as well conveyed by the narrator uh, in different ways, and, and also just simply by the, the development of the plot. Um, Glencora has stayed up late having a spontaneous chat with Alice on Alice's first night at Matching Priory. And Glencora suddenly realises the time. I declare, it's ever so much past twelve. Good night now, dear. I wonder whether he's come up. But I should have heard his step if he had. He never treads lightly. He seldom gives over work till after one, and sometimes goes on till three. It's the only thing he likes, I believe. God bless you. Good night. If such a deal more to tell you, and, Alice, you must tell me something about yourself too, won't you, dear? Then, without waiting for an answer, Lady Glencora went, leaving Alice in a maze of bewilderment. So this little conversation is, of course, not between Glencora and Palliser, but this little uh, snippet of conversation um, really illustrates a lot about Glencora's character. She's spontaneous, she's very affectionate, um, she's a romantic, she has a romantic view of life, she has a romantic view of other people, she sees the spirit in them, uh, and their emotional life within them, which is the complete reverse of <laughs> Plantagenet, really. Um, also, it's revealing, um, there's this little phrase, isn't there, that um, he never treads lightly, Plantagenet never treads lightly. And that's both at the physical level, and um, as the reader knows from the um, psychological level, from the personal level. He doesn't understand subtlety, really. Um, he understands form, he understands uh, procedure, he understands um, the technical relationship uh, between a man and a woman within marriage, insofar as he's the husband, so he should 
really carry sway in most of the situations. Glencora is there to support him. Um, but it is part of the very clever writing of the novel that these little um, pointers are slipped in here and there. <coughs> the narrator also describes both Plantagenet and Glencora at different points in the novel. And one quite interesting description of Glencora arises in chapter 49, how Lady Glencora went to Lady Monk's party. And this is a very interesting description against the extremely feminine character that Glencora possesses. There were many things about this woman that were not altogether what a husband might wish. She was not softly delicate in all her ways, but in disposition and temper she was altogether generous. I do not know that she was at all points a lady, but had fate so willed it, she would have been a thorough gentleman. So a lady and a gentleman both concepts belonging to the uh, social level of, of gentry, uh, belonging to the group who might in an old-fashioned way be referred to as gentlefolks. There was historically a whole code of behaviour um, emanating from the idea of gentilesse coming from uh, the chivalric code that pertained to being of this social group. So Glencora, in terms of her principles, in terms of her overall moral code, in terms of her sense of what is right and what is wrong, what is due to others, what honesty comprises of, where one's duty lies, how one's duty should be fulfilled, that her moral compass is fully operational. It's just simply that en route to the fulfilment of this uh, <laughs> full understanding of the moral code, Glencora is rather more adventurous than a woman in polite society at this time was supposed to be. She engages more in a level of rebellion, a level of defiance against the uh, strictures of the social codes of the society in which she finds herself. She doesn't altogether submit. And in those ways she is unladylike. But at the level of her nature and at the level of the truth about her personality there is this generosity and this according to the standards that are under discussion, this, this way of right thinking. Women of this rank should more normally have been uh, a great deal more reserved than Gankora, uh, a great deal more preoccupied by etiquette, form, protocol, um, that their relations with others would uh, be carefully managed in order to get the most out of them in terms of um, getting the most social advantage out of them, getting the most um, advantage in terms of um, ambition in whichever area out of them. Glencora's agenda just simply isn't set this way. She doesn't really have an agenda. She really is all about love and loving she has the leisure and she has the opportunity because of her position in life to simply be interested in love. And it's whatever kind of love, love of a friendship, love of a husband, love for the child that she doesn't yet have is something that she also longs for. Um, it, it, it's interesting. Palliser, Plantagenet Palliser, accords much more to the to, to many of the sort of stereotypical masculine qualities um, of, of being a little bit more rigid, of being a little bit more formal. Um, and, and against this quite masculine front, um, that Glencora should also be described as a perfect gentleman is quite intriguing. Um, they're the most unusual creation of a couple. Um, and really, really enjoyable to read. 
um, and discover in the novel.